Hello and welcome to The Last Andy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm here, joined here today by Fen. Hello. Audrey. Hi, everyone. And I will be your host, Alexis. Today, Audrey will talk to us about Dungeons and Dragons Bedlam in Neverwinter, and Fen will discuss the game Leviathan Wilds, while I'll talk about Eat the Reich, a new TTRPG. But first, we'll start with seeing how everyone is doing in the Stanley Catch-Up. So, how have you been doing, Audrey? Uh, I've been doing fine because we are in the midst of holidays here, like lots of May uh, days off happening, so I've been taking a much welcome rest um, because the last few weeks and weekends have been pretty busy with the convention at my uh, role and board gaming uh, club uh, during which I could test uh, Meadows a uh, pretty lovely game to be honest uh, with, we did with the expansion I was a bit overwhelmed but ended up enjoying it Uh, I also um, hosted, let's say, a painting class for beginners, which went pretty well as well, with six or seven uh, people, which were completely new and everyone had fun. And on the evening, I helped my husband host a board game multi-table event, where the plot was that all the tables were linked, and the... um, scenarios had to be quite deadly like one death every 30 minutes and every time someone would be dead they would come to the room of the death and there there would be a kind of um puzzle with symbols that they have to that they had to find in the different tables so there were four tables uh, and then they were resurrected but in the body of another character in another table so like we had one caveman that was dead then going into the Cthulhu uh, hack universe and then they went into Sombre I'm not sure if there is a, I'm not sure the name in English of the game but which is like about fairy tales and dark stories and stuff like that and the story, the, the scenario was about fairy tales uh, we had Ansel and Gretel from the fairy tales that died and that went into other uh, scenarios like Hawkmoon and brought a German accent there it was very fun but extremely tired to help uh, organize that and bring the death to the to their new table and stuff like that so yeah pretty pretty tired to be honest um other than that enjoyed a lot the fallout uh tv show um, i'm not going to go into details but i think it's one of the best uh, adaptations of a video game into cinematic thingy that i've ever seen and for the last few days i've been putting quite the hours into hades 2 which i'm not going to spoil but i enjoy it a lot and i'm waiting on my board game table it should be done in the next few days hopefully i can't wait (laughs) it's going to be so great i'm going to i will share pictures when i have it for sure yeah i think that's all for me And, and you alexis what's new uh, I've been doing well myself. We had some friends over uh, last week from Sweden. Uh, it was very enjoyable to, to have them over for, for a little bit. Uh, we played a couple of board games. We played a lot of Jackbox. Um, nothing super new to, uh, to bring up to the table. Uh, what about you, Fen, recently? Yeah, well... Um... I think, uh, let's see, we're in the same position as Audrey with like plenty of holidays around this period. So it's been dealing with the, the garden. Um, a lot of things have died recently, which I was concerned about, I think, last time I was here. Um, but yeah, so we've still got more work to do on that, which is fun. Uh, other than that, the weather is just starting to turn towards uh, summer. So it's getting a little bit warmer, but... The mosquitoes haven't turned up yet, which is always, always a bonus. Um, I've let's see. Uh, I, I just um, learnt that Bus from Splotter and Indonesia from Splotter are both getting like reprints, which is uh, quite exciting. Um, Bus is like people have been waiting for that a long time for it to come back. It's really, uh, really good. Uh, and Indonesia is something I I thought about picking up when second edition was out but uh, by the time I decided I would it had sold out which is that's the situation with splotters you know buy them when you want them or when you're thinking about them because they they have limited print runs 
Uh, outside of that, I've been um, enjoying a lot of an older Eternal Magic format. Um, I've just knocked a little sleeves on the floor. Um, called Pre-Modern, which is a super interesting little format. It's called Pre-Modern because it takes place before the introduction of the modern frame. It covers a period from 4th edition all the way through to Scourge, so it's um, it doesn't include anything of like the original uh, revised and limited dark, all those like super super rare cards. Instead it's it's mostly cheap cards. Mostly. There there is a couple of exceptions, like um, Mox Diamonds are uh, like 400 euros a, a pop, so, um, but the thing is it's a casual format, so you just play Proxied, and that's like, fine. Uh, so yeah, most, most of the cards have been, most of the cards have been re-edited at some point anyway, right? No, no, oh. <laughs> no, there's a, there's still a whole bunch that haven't been, re like, had reprints, um, but a lot of the staples have, and those that haven't aren't, mostly aren't too expensive as i said so it's uh but it, it doesn't really matter because like i say just you, you've got a everyone who's got a printer has got a way of making proxies you know you just slide just slide a card in the sleeve stick a printed piece of paper in front of it and that's good enough because this isn't an official format this feels to me a lot like commander before wizards started getting their grubby mitts all over it and printing commander product everywhere it's just it's a set environment. You know there's never going to be any new cards coming in. There's a curated ban list that's very well put together. They've smartly cut like some important cards. Uh, some of the most powerful cards ever in Magic were printed during that period. Um, this is where the Combo Winter um, name came from. That I, That's a horrific time in Magic for players. Like, insanely bonkers. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's just... It, it feels great, and it's got like over fifty different decks and viable, which is yeah, it's really wide and in, in what you can play. And I kind of really enjoy the fact that the creatures, if they're aggressive, they're aggressive with a downside, as opposed to this later editions versions where like somebody plays a two drop and you sit there going, "I have to kill this right now." Um, there's a bit less of that, which is it's nice. It's a very chill format, and I think it's becoming more and more popular with the um, content creator scene. So we'll we'll see where things go uh, with that. But yeah, that's that's mostly what I've been um, I've been doing. Uh, and um, I, I think we should just let's should we get to the games. Yeah, let's just jump into the games. So first of all, we'll be. Yes, let's jump into the game. I was muted, I didn't realize. Uh, first of all, let's jump in with Audrey to talk uh, about Dungeon Dragon Bedlam in Neverwinter, or in the French title, uh, Chaos dans Jamais l'hiver. <laughs> Chaos à pas d'hiver. Uh, yeah, one of the most Not much better. One of the most horrible translation, uh, pas d'hiver. I, I never could wrap my head around that. Uh, because there was video games Neverwinter Nights, uh, which was my first foray into Dungeons and Dragons, and which they, like kept Neverwinter Nights in French, and then I was like, oh, it's by Diver actually in the official translation. What? I was just. Yeah. Um, before, <laughs> before we were talking very briefly about the title before um, we started recording, and I, I thought for listeners. Um, like I agree, bedlam in Neverwinter is kind of a, a terrible choice, but uh, the word bedlam is a very brief history of, uh, of where it comes from. In London, there is a hospital called St. Mary's Bethlehem, or Bethlehem Hospital, or Bethlehem Royal Hospital, and it became called bedlam because of pronunciation through, uh, like pronunciation has changed a great deal in the uh, English language over the centuries, and we're talking centuries, um, that this, this hospital's been around. So that's where the term bedlam comes from. There was like a bedlam um, uh, film in the 1940s with Boris Karloff, a horror movie. It's inspired a lot of horror and films and TV, just to give you an idea of what this hospital's uh, past is like. So that's where... Bedlam comes from, but I agree it should just be called Chaos in Neverwinter. 
Uh, thank you for the context. Um, yeah, I was surprised. Anyway, let's jump into the game. So this is, uh, there is a subtitle, which is in French, Un jeu d'aventure façon escape game, as joué en trois parties, um, escape game-like adventure games uh, in three uh, rounds. Uh, so yeah, there are three rounds, and so far we have played the first two, so I cannot speak about the third, but that's enough to have a feel for the game. And um, anyway, it's a game that you end up probably selling or passing on after you have played it. Uh, like the Micro Macro, uh, for instance, uh, there is no need for replayability. Except that Micro Macro, there, ha there are some bonus scenarios online. Here, you just don't get that. So first off, the box is pretty well organized because when you open it, you have like uh, left a box and right some uh, stop, don't open anything, read the instructions before playing. And I think that is for narrative games uh, always something very great to have some stoppers, uh, some don't read that um, on the two edges of decks of cards and stuff like that. So uh, I think that's really cool when you open it that uh, you just see that. You have a rule book, you have some uh, cards and some tokens and some map tiles. Uh, everything is slotted uh, together and everything has like um, paper. Um, uh, I don't know how to call it, but like bands, paper bands around them to keep them tight. So I really appreciate seeing a bit more paper instead of plastic, um, even if it's not very easy to open, but that's not a problem. Uh, so yeah, you have three stacks of tiles, you have three stacks of cards, uh, and uh, each numbered by act, and some other stacks of cards, which are like the loot, and the characters, and a few models, but let's not talk too much about them. There are, there are they have different colors to make sure that the red one is the um, dragonborn and the green one is uh, the human, but they are not very like sharp and distinguishable. Uh, so I'm not going to bother with that. And of course, it's Dungeons and Dragons, so there is a d20 in the box and a d6 because yeah, that's Dungeons and Dragons, so you need the d20. Uh, um, so how does the game play? You pick a class, you pick a race, they give you each a stat. Um, on this stat, when you do a roll, of course you toss the d20 every time, but if you are doing a roll that corresponds to one of your stats, you roll an extra d6, and if you have two times a stat noted, for instance, if you are a rogue elf, so you have two times dexterity, and you will toss two times the d6 to have your result. So you do the d20 plus one or two d6s or zero, if you do not have the corresponding, and that's your result for any roll. So you're going to compare that to anything that happens. Now, what does happen? So you have the map tiles, you have numbers on them, you go on the numbers at your turn, because you take turns between the players, or you can play solo, of course, as always. Um, and you will go to the numbers, you will pick in the act uh, deck cards uh, the number that corresponds to the tile. For instance, if you go uh, investigate on number 210, you draw the card 210, and you do as it's told on the cards. That's, I think, the important thing with this game is that everything is on the cards. Uh, except, of course, the, the rules, but that makes uh, a rule book of exactly 10 pages, and the rest is mostly just like uh, clues to help you with the um, puzzles. So it goes very fast, and it's not very written small in the rule book, so the rules are very fast uh, to read. You have a design of a dice on every challenge, uh, so you do know uh, with the difficulty that you have to reach with your roll. And of course, as it's D&D, sometimes you get a puzzle, sometimes you also get a fight. And it's very simple because everything depends on the D20 and or the D6. So every monster you toss the d20 when it's their turn, depending on the result they do one action or something else, or just nothing sometimes. Um, and when you roll, you have a difficulty to reach, depending on the stat, you may have it easier or not to uh, fight a monster. For instance, some spiders, they have dex written, so if you have a character with dexterity, you toss your d6 extra to try to hit them. And then every hit is one HP in general. Um, 
so honestly that's the main way the main how to play and you will reveal stuff as you go on like for instance the map tiles you have three or four per each act and you start on the first one and then something will tell you to reveal the other ones uh, one by one and you get so different puzzles for instance there is a door you will have to find a mechanism to open it and then rotate it and when you do the rotation you get a number and that number gives you the number of the next card to, to get as it's often the case for instance in the unlock games and sometimes you have something that gives you clue for the big uh, puzzle because each act has a big puzzle that you have to solve to understand what cultists are doing because yes it's CND so there have there has to be some cultists at some point um, and so yeah uh, you have of course an envelope with a clue and the uh, complete solution of the act puzzle so at the end you can still progress to the next act and let's say have the answer if you did not find it and honestly i think it's very i think it's very well organized um i think the box could have been a little bit smaller uh because there is a kind of cardboard insert it doesn't take too much space uh, but there is a bit of blank space so i think some space could have been gained but it's the standard uh box format of the days um and I think it was something like 45 or 50 euros, which in my opinion is a little bit too much when there are only three acts. Uh, I think it would have been a little bit more worth it with four or five acts. Um, but then I, I think the game is well designed, to be honest. Uh, everything makes enough sense that I'm not too annoyed uh, with, with that um, on the box it's written that it's approximately 90 minutes per act uh, difficulty is 4 out of 5 for, for now with the two scenarios I would say more 3 out of 5 on difficulty but I heard that the third scenario is much more difficult uh, so we will have to see when we get to that before we sell the box uh, because I'm not sure we have friends that would be interested in that um also yeah the box actually says two to six players so i'm i apologize you cannot play that solo but i think it's best played three players uh because first you can make a mixture of a group where all of the six uh, stats are represented so you mix them um and six players i think you, it would be too long to wait your time and you would feel like you do two or three actions on the whole scenario so i think that would be way too long in my opinion yeah three may maybe four maybe four let's say but i think three is really really uh the, the best option so yeah I, I think that's most of what i can say about the the game box well constructed game feels like D&D to be honest uh, all of the thematic stuff are well sometimes there is a little bit of text in green that asks you to role play the interaction like oh tell how you escaped from the uh, spider webs for instance uh, which can lead some people slowly to actual role playing game yeah I think it's fine to be honest I would give it a 7 out of 10 maybe 6.5 if you play with too many players Right. Um, so, it's it, does it lean more into the escape room vibe then? Um, I was uh, rather because it feels it's got a lot of um, like sealed packets, hasn't it, and stuff like um, you open as you go along. Am I am I right in? in yeah, it's it, it's mostly the the act deck, which right. is like I don't know f fifty cards per uh, per scenario, which okay. but. There are like the three three monster cards for each fight, for instance, or mm -hmm. two sometimes uh, inside it. Uh, there are let me let me count uh, one, two, four, six, eight uh, um, puzzles in Act One, two, six, uh, seven in Act Two, two, six, seven, and eight again in Act Three. So there is a bit of a mixture of um, fighting and puzzles. I think uh, we spent a little bit more time on the puzzles uh, than on the rest, uh, to be honest. Okay. 
Um, and this is this has got dice rolls in it. Do you yep. feel that if like you screwed up all your dice rolls, you still have a chance of solving the um, scenario, or or what? That's, that's something I'm not sure about because I've not seen many of these with extra randomizations. It's like have they built enough of a safety net in, or uh, is that kind of a replay situation? Of uh, honestly, the imp. Well, there are two things. First off, there is like all the, for instance, you fall into a pit and roll a dice to know the, 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 the outcome. Uh, these ones, like the, the outcomes, either the positive or the negative, the difference is very small. It's like lose one HP. Uh, characters have something like between seven to 10 HPs, maybe eight to 10. So it's not too impactful. And every time your character rolls a 20, uh, there is a critical hit, which allows you either to deal one damage uh, to a monster or to heal one HP. So um, yeah, that's not too punitive and for the fights honestly some of the monsters as long as they do not roll a 12 or a 14 plus they do nothing. So sometimes the, facts, the fights can actually be a little bit long because all the rolls are like 5, 8, 10 and no one does anything. So it can feel pretty long but it's not in I do not feel that it's very punitive uh, there is an envelope which says when you die open this and we haven't had a death so far so I don't know what's inside to be honest uh, but I do not feel that it's very punitive to be honest and that's why as well the difficulty uh, for I do not feel that on the fighting and HP side it warrants that right yeah, that's. Uh, I'm a little disappointed by you describing that you can just have turns where everybody just does absolutely nothing. That that always feels like dead time in a in a board game. I hate missing as a mechanic. In, in role playing, I think it's interesting, especially because there's there's story beats and moments. But in a board game, if you're having that much, that sounds um sounds a bit unfun. But, yeah, um, but at, at the same time, it also carries uh, what happens in Dungeons and Dragons, where in the fights as well, some turns can happen where everyone misses. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but that's that's just uh, usually a bad feel at the table. So. Yeah. Um, it does seems like it plays a lot more like Dungeon and, and Dragon than I would have thought. It kind of reminds me of those older um, Dungeon and Dragon board games. Um, inspired by uh, your quest might be i haven't played this so i can't really compare sadly um but yeah may may maybe I, I i wouldn't know uh, <laughs> but you you have lots of uh, classes and races you have like almost everything you uh, that you can imagine uh like in the races you have the elf you have the dwarf you have a gnome uh, the drake the human tiefling um then all the classes, and they all have uh, skills as well, starting gear and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it, I, I just, um, it's, it's uh, the Castle Ravenloft ball game and um, Dragons of something. That's the ones you're thinking, obviously, Alexis. Wrath, uh, yes, Wrath of yes. Ashardalon, Ash yeah. So, those are the one. Mm. It, it does. Um, I would have expected the game to be. Uh, less than just like a dungeon and dragon team but mostly be a sort of a escape room um like a lot of other games are but this seems to be a bit more involved and with a lot more moving parts and and ability to create your to have your own specific characters and stuff that's mm. quite interesting yeah i think that if you had let's say a kid who's 12 or 14 and who's been curious about mommy and daddy playing dungeon and dragons or mommy and mommy by the way um and they're curious that could be a very nice way to introduce the kid uh, to dungeons and dragons and say okay these are the races uh, this is what uh you could imagine doing and things like that and yeah i, th I think that could be a good thing to bring people to actual role playing is in part because of all the green text which says oh describe how you do this because then that is like peppered salted and peppered uh, here and there and um, that, that can be I think a good way I see like a little D&D &D taster yeah exactly exactly hmm okay that's an interesting um spin on the escape well escape and mystery uh, type things for sure yeah adding a bit more 
uh, combat and, and a little bit more randomness. I was concerned whether it would be too punishing, but it sounds like they've thought about that um, for sure. So that's mm. that's good. Yeah, so you get quite a bit of flute that allows you to add plus two to a roll, to heal, etc., etc. Un- unless you get a baguette cassé, of course. <laughs> Broken stuff. Yeah, yeah, always a always a problem a broken staff. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think that this um, may be of use in the third act because in the third act you might have been expected to circle through the loot deck, and then you will have to use it in a puzzle in the third act. I'm expecting that, and I hope it does happen. To be honest. Well, you'll have to um, do a, a little short catch up. Uh in the future yep. once you've played it and just say whether it was difficult or um or you know not just or uh, if it was difficult and how fun it was um yep. that, that'd be interesting to know we'll do that all right that does sound quite interesting yep um on the other hand fan you've been you've been working with uh, some uh, with a new kind of a uh, bus battler it seems yeah, I have. Uh, so, just recently arrived on my doorstep is a little game that could by Moon Crab Games. These are guys who've done a bunch of uh, famous designs for uh, for Fantasy Flight in particular. Uh, the lead designer, um, uh, Justin Kempanin. I hope I pronounced his name correctly, surname. Uh, he's done like uh, Condottier, Imperial Assault, Warhammer Quest, the adventure card game, uh, loads of Descent stuff, like a very prolific um, designer. And so this feels in some ways like another, uh, similar to Earthborn Rangers, some ex-Fantasy Flight guys taking all their experience and everything and going on to make their own thing. Although where Earthborn Rangers very much feels like this is Arkham Horror, but reskinned, rebalanced, uh, and um, with some interesting new mechanics to switch stuff up. Leviathan Wilds feels completely new. I mean, it's describing it as a boss battle is definitely correct, uh, but it's it's thematically not that. Um, so uh, the, the, here's the 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 pitch. The the thing is that. The, the description for the game, which is long ago, the once gentle Leviathans lost their minds and tore the world apart. After generations of hiding and struggle, humanity discovered that the frenzied Leviathans can be restored. Climbers willing to take the risk must explore the wilds and work together to remove a series of binding crystals to heal the Leviathans roaming the world. So that's the first big difference is thematically this game isn't look at these big bosses, let's kill them. It's look at these big bosses, let's smash up the crystals that are making them behave terribly um, and so that's the goal in every single scenario uh, is to break and destroy these various uh, binding crystals that are spread around the board but we'll get there i i like that it's not just killing them yeah yeah it, yeah it, it's a big change and it actually makes this a lot easier to introduce to younger players um, mm. uh, but, uh, it feels more modern more like yeah friendship helping uh, restoring and maybe a bit of ecology yeah. Well, I, I th- well, it's very clear that um, that the guys who worked on designing all of this have played Shadow of Glosses because that's like the primary big pitch is um, when you sit down to play, you'll choose a Leviathan to go against. You'll open up a spiral bound book to a double page spread that pictures the Leviathan and that's the board you're playing on. It's got a whole load of nodes spread across it. Most of them are kind of just white nodes, generics, like spaces you move into. Some of them have a little line underneath that indicates through a ledge where you can stop and rest. Uh, the bottom of the uh, board has these um, ledges because it's the ground. Uh, there's also spaces that are yellow, representing difficult terrain. Red represents like dangerous terrain you'll get hurt for climbing over, but you can jump past. And then there'll be some mushrooms. There's always six mushrooms growing on every Leviathan that have their face down. And then when you pick them, you'll turn them up. You'll look what you got. And you've got a little bonus ability you could use at some point. Um, and then the, also there's spaces. There's deliberate spaces and gaps within the Leviathan's um, board design where you can jump across or glide across. Uh, so it's 
really doing a good job of expressing that climbing up and down visually. It feels like you're climbing up and down on the side of a leviathan. So start the game after you pick the leviathan, you'll then grab yourself a climber and a class and you shuffle the two decks together. The climber deck is usually like just a couple of cards and the class deck is like the bulk of the cards. Um, there's a whole bunch of different climbers that do have all sorts of varied um, special things like Chia um, gets to grab an extra mushroom from the supply when they rest so they have more mushrooms available or uh, um, Hazard can spend a grip, I'll talk about that, to block um, block one so if they were going to take damage they can spend a grip to take a bit less damage because they're, they're quite good at that or um, Kestrel. Uh, Kestrel has uh, they first of all Kestrel is our is is non-binary which is super cool um, and also Kestrel has uh, a, a lot of very like two cards all about um, controlling maneuvering maneuvering one's called Ride the Wind which is like a big mega jump and the other is um, Twin Talons which is a pair of climbing pickaxes and this has some very cool mechanics that I'll I'll get into. Uh, you then have a little board. These boards are double layer. They're gorgeous. Um, and they're really cleverly done on the double layer because they don't just have the cutouts on the front side. The back side has a cutout at the top because on your turn, you'll choose one of your cards from hand uh, to be your action points. And you slot it into the action point space on the board. It conceals all of the text, uh, but leaves you with the action points and any spaces you can ignore, like ignore the effects of for the turn. So they've done a good job in you physically set it up and make it very clear for yourself. This card I spent for my action points and I ignore everything else on it, the, the text on it, um, which is really nice. Uh, each climber also has a, a section that where you put your climber card for your special ability. You've got a focus token that um, sometimes you'll be allowed to focus and then you can spend that token to get a temporary bonus to a given card that you're playing. Uh, on the left side you'll have your deck, which is also your grip, and right side you'll have your discard. Um, so on a once that's all done, you'll set up the board with all the crystals, populate them, populate the mushrooms, sort out everyone's uh, characters, and then you will take the Leviathan's uh, threat cards and set them up. And there's a little board that shows you where to put them, and it has a rage track. You can choose four different settings to start it on. The difference between them is it's how enraged the Leviathan is. So normally, let's say you play on normal, no cards will start the game enraged. So they all start on a softer side. Each threat card is like double sided, not double sided, double ended. So one half is this is the normal move and the other half is the enraged move. Now as each round ends, and that round is five Leviathan threat cards, You'll move a token forward on the rage track and it'll it potentially increase the number of enraged Leviathan cards you have to deal with. And the enraged Leviathan cards are, you know, they're not significantly more dangerous, but they are dangerous enough that if they start piling up, you're going to have a really rough time. So that's an, one of the great things about this is on top of you having different climbers and different classes and different bosses, uh, all of which provide different leviathans all of which provide various complexities and they give you good signals about the complexities you can also choose to set up the rage track on casual which is uh, starts at zero or normal which starts at zero as well so on casual you actually get two whole rounds of no enraged threat cards or you can start on hard with one already enraged or expert with two already enraged so they've they've covered a whole load of how complex things are make it clear players understand that and also I, I, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Choose your difficulty you want to play. If you want to sit down and play this with some younger players and they haven't really played much before, you can stick it on casual. You can give them uh, a climber com and class combination that's not too complex uh, and, and go from there. And you can play something more difficult and complex and challenging yourself, which is all mm. very, very nice. Uh, yeah, on a turn, so a round, uh, yeah, a turn, sorry, is you'll first of all reveal threats. So you'll flip up the top card of the Leviathan's, you know, first card, the leftmost card of the Leviathan's track. And um, if it's on the, like, normal purple side, then that shouldn't be too bad. 
uh, or if it's enraged, it can be worse. So to give you an idea, uh, we have the um, Sage, who's the starting uh, starting Leviathan. I will interchangeably say boss and monster at times because it's hard to not to, um, but I do mean Leviathan in each case. Uh, so for example, this one's called Hunker Down, and on the normal mode, it's active, push, one, and the arrow points downwards. So the active means the you you're the active player and it's going to push you down one um once one node at the, when it revolt when it resolves after you've had your go so you get to see what the threat card is have your turn as the climber and then resolve the threat so you get the classic boss pattern of signal response resolve the attack uh, so that's really cool um the difference between these is enraged the sage will again push you down by one but it'll also call you, cause you to fall which means you just drop straight down the column you're in until you reach a ledge and if you pass over any spaces that are red because they're dealing damage they'll deal damage to you so that's um that's just a very soft attack because the sage is quite gentle um compared to some of the later ones for sure and simple as well it's not too complex uh another example just to show things that are a little different, uh, is Arcane Burst. This is an AoE attack, and you'll take this little red plastic target marker circle, and you'll put it around the space that the active player is in, in this case, and then it'll hit that space, and, it, and the diagram shows the other space it, hit, is it, it hits. Um, the Arcane Burst hits up, left, right, and down, as well as the middle space. This won't move, and everyone in those spaces will take two damage, so you've got an area that the game is telling you get out of this or you're going to get hit. If you want to see what's really cool, on the enraged side, it affects the active player, you, and the next player to go. So suddenly you're not the only person in peril, the next person's in peril as well, and they can't move because it's not their turn. Which sounds bad, but that's where things get super interesting, and I'll talk about it in the, uh, the climber section. So... When you come to activate a climber, you'll have a hand of three cards, plus you'll have your deck, your grip, and any cards that are discarded. You get a number of action points equal to one of the cards you choose to play into your action point slot. This is typically between three and five action points, and you'll do various different actions. Uh, climbing, for example, costs one action point, and you can move orthogonally, so up, down, left, right, one space per climb one. You can also spend three action points to jump, and that involves um, going like up, left, right, um, and you skip over a space. And you can also move diagonally like that, but you'll notice you pay three points to only move effectively two spaces. The benefit is you ignore whatever is in the middle space, so you can now jump over an empty space that doesn't have a node in it because it's a gap, or you can jump over dangerous terrain, or, or etc. Et so you can take a diagonal jump to get to a space you need to. So, very cool. There's another action called gliding, which is uh, kind of the reverse. Basically, you uh, drop off and, and use a little like gliding, I guess, squirrel costume type wings things, you know, uh, glider costume. Um, and you you always have to go downwards, but you can move left and right, like choose to move left or you can choose to move right when gliding. So that again, all of these things make sense when you, you can visualize and picture what the climber is doing. Um, the final like main action uh, is striking. So when you're in the same node as a crystal, you can strike it. Uh, the crystals are represented by dice, so they have between 1 and 6 as their value. The amount you strike is the amount of pips you knock off it. Once you've removed all the pips on the dice, you've broken that crystal. Now, the interesting wrinkle here is purple crystals are just normal crystals. And, you, you know, you can hit them and you hit them over multiple turns and that's all it is doing is costing you time. If you are hitting um, teal crystals, blight crystals, every time you do a strike against them, you suffer one blight. Uh, and blight is pretty much like permanent maximum health reduction. So you can hit a, uh, a blighted crystal for one and you'll get one blight but you can hit a blighted crystal for five and you'll get one point so what you're trying to do is break the blighted, blighted crystals in as few blows as possible in order to not take too much blight because if ever your blight and your health meet in the middle on the same track you're defeated 
everyone has got like one last gasp to get this job done otherwise the climbers have lost so player elimination does exist but it signals the end of the game uh, so that's kind of quite nice as well uh, there's a couple more of actions there's resting if you're on a ledge you can rest and you will take your discard and shuffle it up and put it underneath your deck so this is important because your deck not only is your your deck it's also your grip and basically if your deck is empty you don't have any grip left so you fall off so you will fall downwards and you'll fall downwards until you hit a ledge so that's like uh, climbing stamina stamina in games which is I think really cool um, and you can mend basically you can spend one action point to heal one point you also have a few anytime actions um, you can use these literally at any time with the exception of sort of stuff is already resolving one of them is forage so you can grab a mushroom um, and the mushrooms will have different effects that you can so you can spend them later for various different things I just grabbed the mushroom uh, this one lets you move one space orthogonally in any direction so that kind of stuff um, then you can you can choose to let go so that is literally just I'm gonna fall uh, you can sometimes use that to avoid being hit which you might find players doing if they're targeted by an attack and it's not their turn they can go okay uh, I can't get out of the way of this I'm just gonna let go because I'll take less damage by falling it, it sucks but it is what it is and finally, uh, you can use your skill. So each climber has a, a different skill. Some of them are uh, activated and um, uh, some of them... Oh, sorry, so using a skill is like the card text, I should say. Sorry, not the um, special ability. So each card has on the bottom half of it a bunch of text that does a various different things depending on the class you're playing. Now I'm going to grab one of the less complex cup um, classes to provide some examples. This is the rough neck which is pretty much a very straightforward and simple um, uh, uh, class uh, so here's one uh, it's called razor uh, no I'm just going to do razor's edge razor's edge is a bit uh, much here's swerve so swerve if you play this and you can play it you know at any time you just discard it to do it it'll let you move one node in any direction including the diagonals so this is a way that you can save yourself from a card when it's not your turn from a, from a threat card um, or sometimes people will have things like not today which is any climber may block two and gain two grip so as the roughneck somebody's about to take a clobbering you can go not today and play that to help them uh, so that gives you a lot of interplay and assistance you can do things even when it's not your turn you can help other people when it's not uh, your turn or not their turn and there is a, a lot of that going on essentially now um, sorry then we resolve the threat which I talked about and then finally you draw up to three cards uh, if we've reached the end of a round because the threat row is completely been um, every card's been revealed and resolved for the Leviathan threat then you'll shuffle them up deal a new threat row advance the marker and enrage any cards that the game is telling you to enrage the enrage from uh, left to right I believe um, I have to look at the rulebook again, I'm not going to do that right now, but they enrage. And um, that's kind of it. You keep going until the Leviathan is healed or one player is defeated and you have your little last gasp. Uh, and it is. There's so much more that goes on within it because the game has a whole bunch of uh, clever little wrinkles each Leviathan throws in. So before. I throw it open to any questions. I'm going to quickly just talk about a couple of Leviathans. So Sage is like your basic learning Leviathan. Um, Sage is a big turtle. It has gaps and um, mushrooms and hazardous terrain and everything, but doesn't do anything super complex. Uh, in comparison to that, uh, the twins are two Leviathans who are represented by cards, and they move around to different spaces on the board. So you have to uh, sometimes readjust and get to where they are. Or we have the, um, one of my favourites is the Deep. This is a four complexity Leviathan. It's underwater. So there's a bunch of air bubbles as mechanics. And also now if you fall, you float upwards towards the surface, which is really uh, sweet and, and interesting. Uh, we have um, the Tyrant as well, uh, which is, I haven't played yet. I'm really excited to play that one. It's a big giant, um, big giant like bipedal thing. 
Every single one of these is gorgeous, really beautifully illustrated, and a lot of work has been done to make sure the illustrations help support what's going on. So if a space has a crystal in it, the illustration has crystals of the matching color or on and around the node. Um, if it's like hazardous or difficult terrain, you may see a few like different modifiers to uh, alter and change that. Uh, it's this is a really well put together um, piece, and it's as I say, it's it's totally opening a new area within boss battling genre because it's a climbing game as well, and you're managing your stamina for climbing, and uh, it, it, it's. It's a single, like it's an evening. You sit down in the evening, you play a Leviathan, maybe then you play a second one afterwards if you have a, if you have time for it, and, yeah, and that's that, it. That's what I was going to mention, is that I really like that this is not a campaign game. Um, it reminds me a little bit of that um, uh, French card game. Uh, Aeon, um, which one is it, uh, Audrey? Aeon? Aeon Trespass? Aeon's no, Aeon, Aeon, Aeon's, Aeon's End, but it, it's not it. French. No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Aeon Zen is not French? Oh, no. No. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, well. It, it reminds me of Aeon Zen uh, a fair bit. That idea of having just a single boss that you can do with uh, with other players. Uh, but this seems a lot more interesting with the whole uh, Colossus kind of aspect. Uh, did you did you mention how many of their... Uh how many of them there are? Um, so within the original thing, there's 17 Leviathans. Plus, it came with a mutation <gasps> expansion Sorry. that lets 17? you... 17? 17, yes. Wow. And yeah, they, they play around with the rules and change things up. Some of them inflict injuries on you. You'll draw like it from an injury deck and that um, will ha affect you for a certain amount of time before you can shake the injury off. Um, but the expansion has a bunch of mutations and essentially they are... You play against a Leviathan and then you take a mutation from a different Leviathan and it mixes things up that way. Uh, so That's quite interesting. So you, you could have uh, some good variation once you're done with the 17, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 17 is going to keep you going for a while anyway. Some of these are challenging. The, um, the Hunger, for example, uh, it's a big giant plant. Uh, the Grid runs sort of diagonally up and then loops back around towards its head and um, you can jump across the middle to try and shortcut it a bit but just just that's just the physical nature of the hunger that's not even taking into account any special rules the hunger has it just sort of changes things uh switches things up like that and i think there's like one of them has a lift a lift card you go up and down in which it, yeah it's uh it's really imaginative they do a great job of mixing stuff up. Production quality is incredibly high. The insert is a plastic uh, insert with spaces for everything and room for sleeved cards. Uh, my only issue is the card quality is lower than I would have liked. This is, it's, it's I think it's double ply because it's, it is linen in finish, but they're very easily bent. Um, mine so much so that they got damaged during packaging and arrived with me damaged um, but moon crab games do have a uh, replacement policy sorted up they do have like a, a you know form you fill in so it's in hand that you will you know we'll get replacement bits but honestly i i have here like a 1995 magic card uh, that is is thicker and more it snaps back better like it holds its shape more these these feel very flimsy uh, so my recommendation is to 100 to at least sleeve the player cards but you probably want to consider sleeving the leviathan cards because they do get shuffled about five times per or more per um per, per game anyway so uh, yeah yeah but they they, they they actually have the wells have space taken into account sleeves and you'll only have trouble if you use quite thick sleeves um so They've covered all of that and everything else. The artwork is gorgeous. The The box action, this is a really weird thing, but it's smooth to open and close. You know, it, do, it, it doesn't have any of that you know, usual friction and the board game fart, you know, um, which it, just stuff like that. The attention to detail is phenomenal um, and, and everything is great. And I think this is a really class game and it is doing something new 
And if you've not played a boss battler and you like games that also use cards, this one's just a great starter. Not complex. This also, this also looks like it could easily be expanded on, uh, upon. Yeah, they are doing a, um, a reprint campaign with an additional expansion. I'm absolutely getting the expansion um, because I think... I'm not even going to have exhausted all of the Leviathans by the time I get to that. And that's even without considering mutations and different combinations of climber plus class plus different Leviathan. There's so much that can be mixed up. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a really exciting, exciting game. Yeah, uh, so my, my um, I, I, I think this is at least a 9 out of 10 game, at least. It's so very, very good and so accessible, but also able to be really challenging. Um, and the the cross play, the cooperative play between players, the fact that you can somebody can be in a lot of trouble and you can go, oh no, I've got just the card for this in hand and pop it out there is amazing. But then you've got the tension of if you're spending lots of hands, you're you're drawing lots of cards, lots of spending lots of cards. Sorry, you're drawing lots of cards from your deck each turn. And so you you need to rest more to avoid running out of grip. All of it, just you have so many decisions, so many things to to do, so much cooperation, collaboration, and the twists that these Leviathans bring in are just yeah, it's it's great. Once you think you've got it all sorted, a new Leviathan throws something you were not expecting. So yeah, my currently every year I play a few games that I go. This is something special. In the past, it's included Aeon Trespass Odyssey and Obsession and Vagrant Song. This is the first game new to me that I've played this year that I'm like, this is something special. All right. Well, quite interesting and something that I've had uh, my eyes upon since you talked about it. I think that the price during the kickstarter was about 80 euros something like that i don't remember fully um but it's probably going to be what 100 on retail maximum yeah um i think it's... i think about 100 euros maximum yeah um but the, as i said reprint campaign will probably have a a, a different price for that and something yeah. including the expansion i think that's a pretty uh a pretty fair price for a boss battler yeah it's a fair um, price and especially of this quality the, 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 as i say and we have 17 leviathans yeah, yeah. yeah 17 leviathans are a load of other things and i say i uh, with the exception of the card thickness this is just a top quality production all round that is quite nice and you you mentioned that they are going to uh send you a fix and i'm hoping that during the reprint they might uh, alter that Oh, uh, it would we'll be... see what happens with the card um, thickness. I'm not sure many people have uh, talked about it yet. I am particularly finicky when it comes to card thickness. I, you know, like I, I don't expect every game to have Kingdom Death thickness cards, um, but uh, I expect you to at least be able to have the snap that Magic cards have because that's needed for handling. But sleeves, sleeves solve it. Speaking of battling monster, on my end, uh, I'm going to talk about Eat the Reich. The year is 1943. Europe is in flame. You are a unit of crack vampire commandos with a single objective. Drink all of Adolf Hitler's blood and <laughs> fatally destabilize the Nazi war machine. That is the introduction for the game uh, Eat the Reich by uh, Rowan, Hook and Descartes, which are the people that made uh, Honey Heist, Spire and Heart, which are top-notch uh, TTRPG. If people don't know about them, I would highly recommend you checking them in. And this one is another banger. Uh, the game, as you might have uh, heard from the introduction, has a very strong pulp team. And it's not just for show, as it is designed to be a sort of campaign in a box. Uh, while there are some rules to run your own campaign and to run different game, uh, with the setting and the system, the book is made to be played in three settings with a theme, uh, with a very strong theme and a team of uh, pre-made characters going through a pre-made campaign. Um, speaking of the book, very quickly, it is gorgeous. Uh, everything is just very brightly colored. There's very vibrant color, like the spine of the book is a 
extremely neon pink. Uh, the the whole thing like kind of glows. It it just looks absolutely gorgeous to have in hand. There's illustrations everywhere. Every single of those pre-made characters has like really cool art peppered through the book. So it all feels super premium, which I always uh, enjoy. Um, this idea of a very pre-made sort of TTRPG books allows the game to have a lot of focus on how it meshes the story and the mechanics together. Everything comes together for the purpose of that story. Uh, the game uses rules that are sort of similar to Heart, that are a bit simplified. So you have uh, five stats. Let me grab them right here. Um, Brawl, Confidence, Fix, Search, Shoot, Sneak, and Terrify. Uh, each of the pre-made character has a score in, uh, in one of those. Whenever you need to do a test, you will roll a number of dice that you're uh, scoring those stats. You will add your equipment and your abilities uh, into a dice pool. And then you can justify to the uh, GM if certain abilities or equipment would work in this situation. Uh, which might give you bonus dice, and then the GM grabs their own dice uh, according to the threat rating of the location that you are or the specific uh, Nazi monster that you're fighting with. Um, once you roll, one, two, and threes are discarded. Um, four and five are successes, sixes are critical. The player can then allocate those dice to do specific actions, uh, and uh, the game wants to sort of... Uh, uh, always fill out those uh, very specific actions, which are either advancing an objective, eliminating a threat, defending yourself against attack, uh, feeding on Nazi blood, or activating a special. Um, whenever you defend, you'll discard one of the GM die. The remaining GM die uh, will do damage to the players that they can they, they can then uh, spread through the different players, and. The whole idea is that the game is meant to be fast-paced, with players literally tr tearing through uh, armies of Nazis and then being, being blocked off by larger threats that they need to work together and make a plan uh, to uh, fight against it. Um, the whole idea is that whenever a player uses a dice, it should give the player a sort of license to... Um, improvise and to, to add to the story and to describe what's happening and to to say what's going to happen at the moment, uh, take control of the narrative a little bit. Uh, this follows a slightly more rigid structure than most RPGs, which is something that um, Ron Hook and Descartes have done quite a lot in the past, but a little bit more in this game, uh, because they really want to give more license to the player to be uh, in control of the story. Uh, I think that's something that comes a lot uh, through their games, that they don't want players to be sort of passive while the GM describes what's happening and then play players just picking an option and having it described to them. Uh, they want players to be like actively involved within the, the narrative of the game, which I think works quite well. Uh, this also allows the game to keep that sort of sharp pulp setting um, and the game is just extremely fun to play. Uh, speaking of the story, uh, let's go through the, the whole setting of the book. So the idea is that it is happening in, I think, uh, 1948 or something like that, in a sort of a slightly different version of World War II, where um, Paris is the center of the Nazi war machine, where Hitler is. Um, the Nazis have used some like weird experiments to create um to like enhance their their own troops and stuff but the game really wants to keep focus on the idea that you are fi fighting fascists not just monsters or and not monsters because they did experiments to them but monsters because they are nazis um the game also comes with like a few warning at the start uh giving good uh, tools for, for players to make sure that the game would not um, go into any uh, unfun directions, uh, some content warnings, uh, some good hints on how to uh, handle the historical inaccuracy or talking about certain touchy subjects, uh, giving players like a few 
uh, specific rules that they can't, uh, that they really shouldn't break. Uh, like, for example, to not kill innocents and stuff like that, even if you are playing vampires. And then it set up the story in, in itself a little bit more, uh, giving you the uh, six different characters that you can you can choose from, uh, which are all extremely well designed and and taught uh, and taught through. Uh, all of them are extremely queer, which uh, every single one of my friends seems to absolutely love. That which I'm always happy with. Uh, one of them, the the character, uh, it's good to mention, is like a half bat, half human vampire. That is sort of a more feral kind of character and. It is described as to be a, uh, a player character that is more suited for players that maybe don't want to talk too much during the game or that are maybe uh, more new to, to role-playing games and want to play something that seems a little bit uh, faster to play with. But I've played the game with uh, more experienced players and they love to play the feral bat monster uh, tearing to, uh, to Nadis too because you can put a lot of spin onto that, uh, strangely enough. Um, the game in itself uh, has this managed to describe its universe in a very small amount of words. Uh, there's like maybe like three pages dedicated on the law of the of what's happening, but they can give some very strong ideas with just a few uh, by ju by just peppering a few uh, a few little concepts. For example, the vampires use drop coffins, which are dropped from uh, planes down onto Paris to uh, to get in, onto location, and they're just the coffins are basically like made of solid steel. They drop onto the ground and they explode. And inside of the coffins, there's uh, non blood that regenerates the vampires as soon as they uh, they land down. Uh, I think that the concept is absolutely insanely cool. Um, and then the rest of the book is mostly describing the different areas in Paris and giving a sort of structured um, path through the city towards, uh, towards Hitler. We're giving players every time two or three options for location that they can visit and stuff that they need to do to progress further or that players can, can uh, improvise on all the, to get uh, up to the uh, Heifel Tower, climb it, and then climb into the first Zeppelin and kill Hitler down there. Um, so yeah, the game also contains a few rules to be able to run your own campaign and to do something slightly different with a few ideas, but that was sort of an afterthought. Uh, the game, when it came on to Kickstarter, was supposed to be just that one story, but players requested to have um, a little bit more guidance to play their own stories, which I think it's a good, uh, a good opportunity and inventive GMs will probably do something very fun with the setting. The game also comes with, well, that, that I'm not fully certain because that might just be the Kickstarter edition, but it comes with prints and with a little uh, prints out of the character sheets and a lot of little extra information, but you might need to make sure what's in the box when you buy the full game. Speaking of, the full game is only at uh, 30 euros in uh, physical form onto the... Um, onto their, their own uh, book plus shipping. And the PDF itself is at 17, which makes it a very cheap game to pick up if you like the setting and want to play something a bit faster paced and uh, something that you can play over three or four evenings. Uh, this is a high recommendation for me. And I think that anything that comes out of uh, Grant, Hook and Deckard, uh, uh, Ron, Hook and Deckard is going to be a banger so you probably want to get into that yeah but in, so, in some ways that make me feel a little bit of agon that i talked uh, about yeah. a few episodes back in that it works a little bit differently it's more let's say tight uh, and self-contained if i may than other games and the focus on narrative and leaving the players uh, hands on the narrative yeah, exactly. Um, and it's it's also... I, I always like that uh, more straightforward approach to uh, RPGs. Um, I mean, a uh, fan, fan can, uh, can attest that a Heart is an absolute banger uh, of a game. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's very well done and put together, for sure. Yeah. 
So yeah, a huge recommendation for me. All right. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for this episode. So you can catch us over at patreon.com slash the last ND. And it will be until next time we have been the last ND. So it's going to be a goodbye from me. A goodbye from Fen. Goodbye. A goodbye from Audrey. Bye bye. And remember that the last that the second E in Standy stands from uh, Escape, I guess. Yeah, if that gimmick is starting to get a problem. <laughs>